Welcome to my channel. Please click like, share, and subscribe. This is Motown Chronicles, Part 6, Diana Ross. After the Sullivan Show, Florence's drinking became more serious, especially when she went on a two-day binge after the group recorded a live album at the Rooster Tale, which was never released. Either she wasn't allowed to sing her solo, People in the Show, or she didn't want to. According to Gil Askey, she was complaining that, that her voice was hoarse and she couldn't do the tune. Diana heard this and said, Okay, why don't we do the symphony melody, comprising five standards from their I Hear a Symphony album, on all of which Diane sang lead. When Flo realized that we had replaced her one song with five Diana songs, I think she got depressed. But Flo said in an interview that when they were rehearsing people, Gordy taunted her by telling her that her voice was weak and she looked overweight on stage. Finally, he took the number out of the act. She never did it again. Florence drowned her despair in drinking. Do you see how bad she's making us look, Diana asked Mary. Yeah, pretty bad, Mary agreed half-heartedly. Well, I'm going to do something about it, Diana said. Florence was beginning to lose hope that the group would ever be the same old gang again, or at least as she had perceived it. She realized that Diana was not only becoming a major star, but also had Barry under her thumb. Why couldn't I have been born skinny, ugly, and big-eyed, she once jealously asked another Motown artist when she was in a drunken stupor. The more Florence drank, the more weight she gained, and the more uncomfortable her tight, form-fitting stage wardrobe looked on her. Barry could be cruel when he wanted to be. You know something, Flo? He told her one day. For a fat girl, you don't sweat much. Diana was an emaciated size three. Mary, a reasonable size seven. And by this time, Florence was a size 12 and growing fast. One night, while out with Diana and his sister Gwen, Barry noticed Flo in the 20 Grand nightclub nursing a martini. He, he went over to her and told her that he and Diana had discussed the matter and had come to a conclusion. We think you're fat, Flo. Oh, you think so, huh? She said calmly. Then she threw her drink in his face, spun around on an easy footing and walked away laughing loudly. As Florence drank and Mary brooded and both complained, Diana made plans. She wrote down her goals very specifically in lists and determined when she would achieve each one. Still suffering from insomnia, she slept very little. During the evening hours, she and Barry would often be in the studio as she recorded and then studied the techniques of engineers and technicians who mixed and mastered her vocals. Diana was interested in everything that had to do with show business. She would shop for hours trying to find just the right outfit that would make her distinctive and then model it for Barry. If he liked it, she would wear it the next day and surprise the girls. She was obsessed with entertainment and how to be the best at it. So bringing a temporary new girl into the Supremes didn't affect her. As long as she was still singing lead, what difference did it make? At the end of 1966, Barry asked Diana what she wanted to do with her future. She was uncertain and only knew that she was unhappy with the way things were working out in the group. Florence's discontent had obviously become a problem, and she seemed close either to getting fired or to quitting. When Ballard visited her friend Gladys Horton of the Marvelettes backstage at the Fox Theater in Detroit, she complained about how miserable she was. I'm an alcoholic behind all of this, she told me, Horton recalled. She said she was afraid of flying. I had to get stoned on those planes, she said. Then she told me she was ready to quit. I was shocked. I thought she had it so good. When Diana heard about Florence's backstage confession, she turned livid. 
She didn't like the idea of Florence being so frank about her problems and about the Supreme's private business with a member of one of the competing Motown groups. Barry told Diana that she could quit the Supremes if she wanted to, and that if this was her decision, he would support her in her solo career. However, he recommended that she continue with the group, but with Barbara Randolph, the girl he had seen perform at the El San Juan Hotel in Puerto Rico in January 1966, taking Florence's place. Marlene Barrow had decided that she didn't want to be a full-time Supreme. Diana felt ambivalent. A solo career was certainly what she had in mind, but leaving the act was a gamble she wasn't sure she was ready to take. Replacing Florence certainly seemed logical, but she feared she would be blamed for the move by a gossiping public and press. Also, say Voss inmates, she was suspicious of Barbara Randolph, simply because Randolph was so beautiful and Gordy was obviously interested in her if he kept her in mind all of this time. She wanted to know who this Randolph woman really was to Barry, said one of Diana's former associates, and Barry assured her that he was not having an affair with the singer. He really wasn't. He just thought she would be perfect to replace Flo. She was extremely talented. The more he talked about her, the more suspicious Diana became. Barry said there were problems and dissension in the group. And that I would be replacing Flo, Randolph recalled. But he said the final decision was Diana's. All final decisions were Diana's, and he wanted me to discuss it with her. I had mixed emotions because I knew that she was the queen of Motown. I wasn't sure I wanted to get involved. I felt that she used her position to keep anyone that might outshine her or have the potential to do that in her place. The Supremes, now with Florence back, were appearing in the same New Jersey city with Barbara Randolph when Barry decided to arrange a meeting between Barbara and Diana. He took me backstage, and I was very excited and nervous, Barbara recalled. Barry knocked on the dressing room door and opened it. Diane, I got Barbara Randolph here, he said very pleasantly. Remember her from San Juan? Now would be the time to talk. I don't want to talk to her. I told you that, Diana screamed at him. Barry, embarrassed, quickly closed the, the door. He turned and looked at Barbara sheepishly and shrugged his shoulders. She was not willing to even speak to me, Barbara said. I knew then that I wasn't going to be a Supreme. It never was mentioned again. It seemed that Diana had made her decision. She would strike out on her own. The last couple of records had not really done very well. My World is Empty Without You sold barely 500,000 copies. Love is Like an Itching in My Heart had done worse, a little over 368,000. But then they rebounded with You Can't Hurry Love, a huge hit that sold over a million copies and the album The Supremes A Go-Go, which became the girl's first number one album replacing the Beatles' revolver on the charts. The time was right to break up the act while it was hot. Gordy had someone in his publicity department feed an item to columnist Earl Wilson about all of the movie offers Diana had been getting, perhaps hoping she would get a few. She didn't. Still, the group's schedule for 1966 was set with only tentative dates. An album titled The Supreme Sing Holland Dozier in Holland was completed. Conceived as a tribute to the guys who had written and produced all of the group's major records. A single, You Keep Me Hanging On, was planned as the last Supremes record. Mary and Florence had no idea that the group was about to break up. Their future was not a, cons a consideration at this point. The announcement of Diana's departure would be made after the Supreme's next engagement at the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas, where they would open on September 29, 1966. 
But then Diana changed her mind. The group would continue and with Florence for the time being. The Vegas gig was an important high stakes engagement for which Florence had decided to clean up her act. Barry Gordy loved Las Vegas because his biggest weakness besides women was gambling. Some of his employees speculated that the main reason he wanted us he wanted his acts to play Vegas and the Supremes were the first was so that he would have a legitimate reason to be close to the gambling tables. Diana shared Barry's enthusiasm for gambling. Road manager Joe Schaefer recalled an incident that happened later during the course of this engagement. She was ahead maybe $20,000, but Diane never quit when she was ahead. The more excited she got, the more she gambled. In a casino, Diana was like a kid in a toy store with a pocket full of change. She was playing five blackjack hands at $500 a hand, and she got busted on each hand and lost. Oh no, not all my money, I heard her shriek. After that happened, I had the inevitable task of having to tell her it was time for her to get ready to perform. I walked up to her, tapped her on the shoulder, and she ripped, whipped right around and threw a drink in my face. The afternoon they arrived in Vegas, Gordy took some heavy losses at the tables. And since she was trying to keep up with him, Diana found herself losing heavily as well. Before they knew what was happening, Barry and Diana were $25,000 in the hole. Afterwards, in Gordy's suite, the atmosphere was morbid, as if there had been a death in the family. No one liked to see the king and queen lose. It was bad for company morale. There was a knock at the door. Diana answered, and it was Don Foster, one of their road managers, carrying a briefcase under his arm. Barry, who acted as if he didn't know what the contents were, suggested to Diana that she open the package. She did. Money? Just look at all of this money, she squealed as everyone gathered around. Barry, a man who certainly knew how to infuse a little life into a party, grinned broadly. Apparently, he hadn't felt very lucky that morning when he woke up, and so he called back to Detroit to arrange for $100,000 in cash to be delivered to his suite in big notes. It arrived at the best possible moment. Let's go back and gamble, Diana begged Barry, which is precisely what they did. Florence and Mary felt uncomfortable with this display of wealth and by Barry and Diana's frivolous attitude. They still remembered what it had been like when there was no money being made, when they were the no-hit Supremes. Even though Barry would tell them to stop living in the past, it wasn't easy for them to shake the memory of being poor, especially since Florence had brothers and sisters back in Detroit who were always on the phone with her begging for money, which she always sent to them. Florence doled out $10,000 on Christmas presents for her family that year, but she felt that that was money well spent. The girls had been rehearsing daily for the Vegas engagement. On the day of the opening, rehearsal was in the showroom. Barry, Maurice King, and road manager Cy MacArthur were sitting in the middle of the empty theater. The Supremes and the orchestra were running through the show. When they finished Queen of the House, Maurice King stood up. Okay, here there will be applause, applause, applause. Now, Diane, he said, pointing at her. It's your intro. Thank you, she began. Ladies and gentlemen, before we go into the next number, I'd like to introduce the girls. On the end is, Barry stood up. You know what, Diane? I can't understand one goddamn word you're saying. Sai, can you understand her? Can you understand one goddamn word she's saying? Not really, Sai said with uncertainty. Diana looked hurt. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, she began again, very deliberately. Now, before we go into the next, slow down, Barry commanded her. Enunciate, Maurice King suggested. 
Yeah, enunciate, Gordy repeated. Thank you, Diana began again. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin the our number, God damn it, Diane, Barry shouted at her, approaching the stage. It's before we go into the next number. Get it right. What is the matter with you anyway? He turned to face Cy MacArthur. Cy, what is the matter with her anyway? Cy shrugged his shoulders. Tired, I guess. Mary and Florence just stood on the stage silent. Their eyes focused on Diana, who was by now close to tears. Barry, please, I'm trying, she pleaded. Well, try harder. She took a deep breath, trying to choke back the tears. Thank you. Before we go into the next number, I'd like to introduce the girls. On the end is Florence Ballard. Diana finished the speech perfectly and then left the stage in tears as Barry, Maurice, and Cy watched silently. The orchestra began playing somewhere, and Mary and Florence dutifully continued rehearsing their background parts. You're too rough on her, Cy said to Barry. She's just a baby, you know. I know what Barry said. But I gotta be, Cy. Why? Cause she's gonna be a star. She's gotta get used to pressure. And anyway, he said with a conspiratorial grin, wanna know a secret? Cy nodded his head. I understood every goddamn word she said from the start, Barry winked at Cy, and then went after Diana. Later that day, a newspaper reporter from the Las Vegas News Bureau interviewed the Supremes in Diana's room. Barry was present with the three girls, and so was musical conductor Gil Askey and road manager Cy MacArthur. The reporter first asked Mary and Florence questions. Both gave charming answers. He then turned to the lead singer and asked, What do you think, Diana? She was about to answer when Barry suddenly blurted out, Miss Ross. Diana, thinking she was being addressed, gave Barry a quizzical glance. Barry jabbed his finger at the reporter. Miss Ross, call her Miss Ross. Florence shot Mary a pained and exasperated expression. No one in the room said a word. After an uncomfortable silence, the reporter carefully rephrased his query. And what do you think, Miss Ross? Barry smiled with satisfaction, obviously remembering the heady mixture of respect and power when in 1965 he made the transi transition from being Barry, everybody's buddy, to Mr. Gordy, everybody's boss. Gordy was discussing business with an influential concert promoter backstage at the Apollo Theater when one of his Artist slapped him on the back, called him Barry Baby, and asked him for a loan. Barry felt humiliated by this blatant display of disrespect. Prior to this incident, he had complained to his sister Esther about not being given the proper respect from associates who had known him before he became wealthy and successful and still fancied that underneath the gold chains and bravado, he was the same guy. He wasn't. Now he had power. After the incident at the Apollo, the word was handed down that he was to be called Mr. Gordy, and that if any artist was in need of money, he or she had to go through proper accounting channels. No one argued with him. So now that Diana was acclaimed as the star of the Supremes, Barry felt that she deserved similar respect and the distinction of being known as Miss Rooks. It would be good for her ego, and it would also keep her happy. When she was happy, she worked harder, was less argumentative, and caused less of a problem for Barry and everyone else. But the two girls who sang with Diana and were still mistakenly operating under the notion that they were, in Barry's eyes, somehow on the same level as she was, just because they sang in the same group, didn't quite agree with Barry's decision. Miss Ross, my ass, Florence huffed after the interview was over, and she and Mary were going back to their rooms. I'll be damned if I'll call her Miss Ross. I think Miss Ross is going to have such a big head now that we're not going to be able to stand her. I gotta agree with you, Flo, Mary said sadly. 
Florence stopped in her tracks and with a very serious expression on her face, looked at Mary for two beats. Listen, you from now on, you call me Miss Flo, she scolded, mocking Gordy's dictate. After all, I am quite a big star. Miss Mary, that's what you call me from now on, Mary insisted. And don't you ever, ever forget it, honey. The two girls became hysterical with laughter. It was hard for them, I think, to admit that Diana was 85% of the group and they were 15%, observed Taylor Cox, who negotiated the Motown contract for the Flamingo engagement with GAC. Cox was the division head of Motown's Multimedia Management Division from 1964 to 1972 and his observations strongly reflect those of others in power positions at Motown at the time. He noted, without Diana Ross, the Supremes were basically nothing. I don't really think the story of the Supremes would have been much different had it been Diana with any other two girls. Mary and Florence were not wise enough, though, to realize that Diana was making their money for them, making them famous, and taking them with her, what they should have done was everything they could to keep her happy. More revelations were forthcoming for Mary and Florence that night. The girls descended to the showroom to prepare for the concert and were escorted to their dressing rooms. Mary and Florence in one and Miss Ross in another. It was the first time Gordy had decided to separate the girls' dressing quarters, and it wasn't a good omen. It obviously did nothing for the group's spirit. Opening night and the rest of the engagement was tense, especially when Gordy ordered fresh roses for Diana's dressing room every night and nothing for the girls. Also, all of the congratulatory telegrams was sent to Miss Ross's dress room, dressing room. Though Diana didn't have much to say about any of this special treatment, it was obvious that she enjoyed the attention. Barry was forcing Mary Florence and everyone else in the entourage to recognize her power and importance. How could Diana Ross help but allow herself to be spoiled by the man she loved? <laughs>